So thank you so much to David Rosenman and the, the entire team at this amazing symposium. I've just had an incredibly rich day and morning um, and evening yesterday meeting all of you. Uh, the, the video that you saw opened our conference in 2007 and just watching it from off stage there, uh, it's, it's remarkable how much of that is still relevant today. And I'm going to do my best in the time that I have to give a snapshot of this really fast evolving space. Uh, when Larry Keeley just spoke earlier, it struck me that uh, while so much is slow to change about our healthcare system, there are pockets of the, of the healthcare system that are changing faster than I can keep up with it. And, uh, and I'll do my best to give us an overview here today. Uh, so first, I should say my co-founder, Matthew Holt, uh, and I started the Health 2.0 conference, and much of what I'm going to be discussing today uh, are, are slides that he's worked on as well and, and, and spoken about in his attempt to give a framework to this space. Uh, and, and Matthew couldn't be here today, and this is also another incarnation of Matthew. He sometimes appears on stage at Health 2.0 in various incarnations. Uh, Matthew is a, the, found, the author of the Healthcare Blog, a very well-read blog in healthcare, and uh, a veteran consultant and, and healthcare strategist. But let's just take a few minutes and go back to what is Web 2.0? And we may have heard the term, but really, what does it mean when you break it down and turn into its component parts? So we saw this sort of chart in the video earlier, and when we think about it, around 2005, it wasn't that the internet was born, the internet had been around, but the way we interacted with the internet was changing and the way we interacted with each other was changing. And terms like the long tail, social software, blogs, ease of use, uh, recommendation engines, these were starting to become terms that we heard and, and something was changing. An ecosystem of companies developed, many of them dropping their vowels, spelling their names in different ways, uh, grew up to be sort of the Web 2.0 ecosystem. And what these companies had in common, YouTube, Wikipedia, they shared an element of self-publishing, the fact that it was now much easier for individuals to self-publish, uh, an element of sharing and collaboration. And so in various shapes and forms, we saw an industry and a set of companies uh, come, come about completely outside of healthcare. And Tim O'Reilly coined the term Web 2.0 uh, with a few sort of component definitions. He talked about services and not packaged software. So for example, when you have iPhoto on your Mac, it means one thing, but Flickr is a site on the internet that lets you do even more with your photos. It lets you share them, archive them, group them, and in so, in so doing is offering a service on top of just a piece of software. Data sources that get richer as more people use them. When we think of Wikipedia, if it were just one person writing that entry, it means one thing, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an intelligent resource that gets better as more people use it. Trusting users as co-developers. Uh, here, it's not just about producing a product and putting it out there in the world. Your customers, your users can actually be part of shaping your product and service. Harnessing collective intelligence for anybody that's traveled and has looked at a travel, uh, a uh, TripAdvisor type site or a site where people give opinions and their ratings. We know that we like to hear what lots of people think. Leveraging the long tail through customer self-service. Again, Larry talked about Amazon and what that's done for bookstores. If, if any single corner bookstore had to have every single book that every one of us in this room would want, we that make up the long tail of individual needs, uh, it would be impossible. But Amazon can do that because of its scale and its ability to search and archive information. Software about the level of a single device. An, an easy example is the iPhone, iPod, uh, iTunes. Many different interfaces, but sort of software that sits above different devices. And the concept of lightweight user interfaces. So that was roughly what Web 2.0 was beginning to mean uh, about five years ago now. Highlights from the first Edelman Health Engagement Barometer, studies like this and others began to talk about what implications this was having in healthcare. Uh, in a study of over 5,000 consumers in various countries, uh, we began to see the rise of individuals who were using social media, blogs, self-publishing, to really communicate and engage around health. And when it came to health, and because it's personal, it's highly significant to the individual, people really needed a social element to how they searched for information. 
offline in their communities and neighborhoods, they talked most with friends, families, their doctors, and online, they also wanted that kind of connectivity when it came to health. Health expert blogs became the most credible source uh, of health information online, uh, when coupled with expert sources as well. The other uh, interesting dimension was that while 80% of the online sort of community, which is almost everybody, about 100 million Americans, went online to do a search about healthcare. What was even more interesting was that about a third of those people connected to other people or to the content that other people had created about health when they went online. So what does all of this mean for the term health 2.0? What is health 2.0? I'm still wondering. <laughs> so. Here's Matthew Holt, my business partner's best guess at the constituent parts, and, and his is not the only sort of framework. I'll be giving a few others as well. And he talks about four components. Personalized search that finds the right answer to the long tail. And this has to do in health with people with rare conditions, with very specific health needs that go beyond what published guidelines might recommend. It's one thing to read a guideline for how to take care of a certain disease, and it's quite another thing to be an individual with a certain genotype and certain medical history. What is the right answer for me? What's the right treatment for me? Better data integration and presentation. Uh, again, there's so much knowledge and accumulated wisdom out there, sources of data, but they're often opaque and inaccessible by the end user, by the patient, or even the doctor. Health 2.0 is about products and services that are presenting information to the user in usable ways. It also has to do with communities that capture the accumulated knowledge of both patients and caregivers. So instead of things being about a one-to-one -one interaction between a doctor and a patient, it's now about a many-to-many -many interaction as many people share ideas and improve the overall wisdom. And tools for content and del delivery and transactions that are, that are intelligent. This will also, I will be giving examples of what we mean by this, but again, um, ways of really engaging with information and actually doing the business of, of healthcare in ways that are, that are easier and smarter, and, and just maybe a more significantly empowered end user. This is a wiki page that goes into various people's definitions of Health 2.0, and we work in a very friendly uh, and, and lively community where we debate, argue, um, and it's really a lot of fun. And so here's a few different people's take on what this space means. So Matthew and, and Jane Saracen Khan, a, a um, leading consultant and analyst, again, have talked about social software, lightweight tools that promote collaboration. Scott Shreve, uh, the founder of an open source EMR company who's now a uh, consultant and, and writer, talks about a broader vision. He says Health 2.0, once it engages all aspects of the healthcare system, will be about improving safety, efficiency, and the quality of healthcare. He goes beyond just the technology. Ted Itan, who's with Kaiser Permanente, has, has started to talk about Health 2.0 as participatory healthcare and patients being effective partners in healthcare. So coming back to a framework again that, that we started with, Matthew and I, and the Health 2.0 conference, just as a proposed way of looking at this space, we think of various bubbles. We think of search, and that is basically the very simple task of how do I find information uh, about health questions that I might have, that being one of the largest buckets, just because most people, I bet you in this room in the last year, have gone online to look up something related to your health, because that type of question is just most easily answered online, at least as a first step. Uh, social networks, we'll be talking a little bit about that, and about their evolution, what they were in 2007, and what we're seeing them become today. Uh, tools, these are uh, online interactive components. They may be on your iPhone, they may be in a device, but they're ways of engaging and, and, and doing transactions around healthcare that ultimately these components connect to allow content information, static um, content, to be connected to transactions in the actual business of healthcare. And lastly, I'll present you with this sort of context for, for the rest of the talk, which is that People have often said, well, isn't Health 2.0 about blogs, and isn't it about social networks? It's certainly where it started. And that's sort of what we've called user-generated healthcare at the left end of the spectrum. What that meant was that individuals sort of following on the activist movements of the 80s, as you've seen in the opening video, were, were taking action. They were sort of writing about their health. They were, they were going online. They were sharing wisdom with other people. Um, 
physicians were coming online and physician-only communities, nurses and nurse-only communities. And this was a, this really burst of user-generated uh, content and, health, and healthcare. We then saw the first set of tools that connected. This was all happening outside of the traditional healthcare system and happening online in pockets far away from the halls of Mayo Clinic, for example. But soon we began to see the advent of tools and technologies that connected consumers and providers. So the first sort of doctor-patient robust interaction tools. Um, American Well and Roy Schoenberg, his company is a great example of that, uh, and a relatively new company given sort of the, the speed at which they've come along and now become part of the healthcare system. Over time, we are seeing that the, the use of these technologies don't remain outside and out there. They really become an integrated into the healthcare system and in so doing, challenge existing patterns in terms of uh, payment mechanisms, reimbursement schemes. They, they work to increase transparency. So over time, um, it's postulated that as these technologies get integrated, there will be reforms in the delivery system, whether, um, and, and no, predictable way, no predictable way perhaps. And finally, the holy grail, or sort of where we might end up um, with sort of the progression of this space, is that because data is being unlocked across various sources, existing databases, the data users are putting in about themselves, and the ability to analyze things and search things and find things at a much deeper, richer level, ultimately, this has the potential to drive drug discovery, therapeutic discovery, and decision making at a deeper level. So let's go back to the three bubbles I presented earlier, search, communities, and tools. And let's dig a little deeper and go into some examples. So one of the, the hallmarks of, of Health 2.0 is we talk a lot about search. And where we started with search, <laughs> you know, I, I still you know, go here a bunch of times to find out answers to things. But we've really seen an explosion of companies that are giving the user, the, the person with a question, a more sophisticated and more personalized um, experience in terms of finding answers. And so here's an example from Helia. And what, what's sort of notable about this is that while it's a search, I can kind of filter it by, by demographic, by ethnicity, uh, race, and gender. Does this show up on your screen? OK, great. And, and this idea of uh, searching based on who I am as opposed to just sort of static content that everybody would read. This is notable here because it's a company called Organized Wisdom, and the idea of putting together in one place for a consumer uh, information from a trusted resource, here's Mayo Clinic's Crohn's disease uh, summary, but also personal experience, blogs, and, 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 and wisdom from those sort of sources side by side. And in fact, the star means that the reviewer on the site found the Mayo's version of the Crohn's disease uh, description to be the most helpful and most effective. Uh, right Health is another company exploring technology called Deep Search, and Deep Search is about unlocking databases that Google and other search engines actually can't get to. It's a, it's a sort of algorithm-based technology, very smart people, uh, way smarter than me. But uh, Right Health has uh, turned out this type of product, which takes information on health topics from genetic information, tests and procedures, and organizes and presents it in a very robust way. Search has also gotten really specialized. You can now search not just on information, but certainly on doctors, hospitals, procedures, clinical trials. And, and this space has just astonished me because every time we think we've sort of solved it and had one sort of better way to find a doctor, there's three or four or five more companies innovating. And um, here's a funny one where vitals, where the doctors are examined. And it, it's not about the early days where people were sort of hostile about, well, there's going to be a profile about me and people are going to say sort of meaningless things. This has gotten to be a very sort of sophisticated set of, of, of companies where, where true exchange goes on, health grades many people will be familiar with, with information about hospitals. Um, Apex MD is a company that's bought a company called Emphasis Search. So here I can go on not just to find a doctor, but I can search by procedure, knee surgery, and then the centers of excellence, the physicians that specialize in that. So it's gotten really sort of nuanced and granular. Um, clinical trials, there's some folks in the room here working in this space. But yes, there's always been clinicaltrials.gov, but how user-friendly is that? These companies are taking, ex again, existing databases, um, adding new analytics, adding new matching capabilities to make them personalized, useful, in, in very surprising ways, and are doing remarkable things. 
Communities. So where did we start with communities? Well, Amy Tendridge spoke yesterday about her experience with diabetes and starting Diabetes Mine. And she spoke about people going to online communities for support, for information, and for advocacy. And those things are still true today. But what we're seeing in, in uh, really exciting ways is the ability for communities to go from something like this, which is a Yahoo group on cancer. There's still thousands of groups in Yahoo where people with various conditions congregate and share information to groups like MedHelp, which now not just take online communities and discussion boards and just sort of sit there as static places for people to come and discuss, but have developed uh, sophisticated health trackers. People actually design their own self-monitoring tracker for various conditions from chemotherapy to asthma publish those trackers and then use them and share their data. And this sort of level of documentation of, of monitoring outcomes has very interesting implications for where, how we think of observational studies in, in the real world now. So MedHelp has 8 million users a month. This is not about, you know, 10 people with the disease sort of saying how they feel on any particular day. It's really becoming something else altogether. Here's just one person's asthma monitoring page on MedHelp. There's hundreds of trackers like this. Uh, here they're talking about their peak flow results and correlating them with their symptoms. Cure Together, um, I know Alexander is going to speak a little later today, but an incredible site where, again, people living with conditions are coming together to self-quantify, share ideas, and eventually, hopefully, drive the discovery for cures. And she'll tell you a lot more about that 23andMe is a company many of you are familiar with, lead, uh, one of the companies leading the sort of genomic revolution. And what was interesting to me, well, you know, I sort of beta tested 23andMe and Navigenics, and I got to see the results of my DNA, which was exciting. Uh, it's still early days, and, and what can be done with that information, we're only just beginning to realize. But what was interesting was they're involving the, the community uh, in voting on what the most sort of pressing research topic might be. So here, migraine seems to be winning. And there's a certain number of people in the, gen the genetic database with that condition, and others that just would like to see it studied. So again, there's a level of participation um, and, and democratization, if you will, of the scientific research process that's, un that's unprecedented and that's enabled by these very intelligent communities that have moved well beyond social support, chat, a message board, a blog. And, that, and those are very important components, but we're seeing robust uh, analytic capability as well. Uh, we also talk about a, a term called tools, and that's just, for lack of a better way of describing, a set of services online that have four dimensions, according to sort of our observations. They're personalized, they're analytical in some way, they support a decision of some sort, and they enable a transaction. And when we first started looking at this space online, a, a tool meant a BMI calculator. You know, let me put my height and weight in, and it'll churn out a BMI, and maybe I'll know something about that, and maybe it'll sort of motivate me to lose weight. But what tools have become is something just far more robust. Uh, and it, they really increasingly have to do with unlocking databases with new interfaces and analytics. So here is um, a page from a physician's desk reference, you know, from the drug compendia. And we've always had access to this. When I was in medical school, I used things like this. I searched and, and read about this. But here's an example of what a very brilliant company uh, by a, a doctor out of Harvard, um, Marlene Begelman, has done. And, and she has said, OK, well, let's take all the drug compendia that exist and uh, do very sophisticated, smart things in the background that have to do with search algorithms. But effectively, for the end user, if I have symptoms, say I'm on four different drugs and I have trembling hands and nausea, um, I enter those in. And within seconds, I'm told that this could or couldn't be a result of my Coumadin interacting with my Zocor. So it's, the, it's smarter than a doctor. And Marlene is a, is a very established physician. But she says no individual could be responsible for knowing that type of thing. No matter how well trained in medicine, it takes this kind of intelligent tool. And uh, she's reported instances where our neighbors' lives have been saved by using this. Uh, I think it's because of these drugs interacting. I'm feeling this way. You know, and that informs, then, the clinical care. Switching gears from the clinical 
to how do you find a, dr um, a health plan if you're an elder looking at Medicare uh, and you're on a number of different drugs. Well, what will my drugs cost me across different plans? So using data from First Data Bank and other accessible sources, Destination Rx has made a very interesting company where you can actually enter your drugs and it'll calculate what they would cost you under various different plans and their enabling choice. Uh, Quicken, where many of us are familiar with from, from our taxes, but from what they're trying to do in health, it's fascinating. Uh, I have a high deductible plan myself. I never know where I am with my deductible. I never know how much I owe my doctor. Um, they'll, they'll take the EOBs, they'll take the data from the health plan, and they'll present it to me in a really effective, simple way. What do, what do I pay? What am I owed? Just tell me what to do. I never read those things in the mail. It's a big, opaque mess for me. And again, on the health and wellness side, uh, we're seeing companies that, again, there's always been sort of calorie counters and how many calories in an apple. I remember going online and looking that up a few years ago. Now, it's, it's just gotten a lot more sophisticated. Tell us what you ate today. Tell us your daily activity, and we'll actually predict um, models for you for how to, how to be. We'll send you messages on your cell phone. We'll, um, there's experiments going on in college uh, cafeterias with freshmen and mobile phones uh, that are seeing amazing results because of just really sophisticated menu analysis and, and, and diet uh, tracking. Here's an interesting tool that has an implication for hospital. Um, you can actually go to InQuick ER and find out in your area what the shortest waiting time will be in the emergency room with participating hospitals. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a simple tool. It's online and it's, it's uh, free and maybe there's models where you pay more, but uh, this is this is just, we, we, there's always been the hope that we'll be able to do sort of the open table of, of restaurant reservations for, for uh, clinical facilities, but we're actually seeing this in action now. And certainly everybody in this room is, is very well aware that it's not just about your PC or your laptop or your home computer. It's about platforms and devices wherever you are. Uh, we saw, we're seeing a great company come out that's scanning product labels in the supermarket uh, using your cell phone that tells you sort of whether if you have an allergy or you're on certain drugs, it'll scan the label and, and tell you at a very precise level of detail that there is something in this product that you shouldn't have. It's not something that you could just read, but it might be like a trace element that might interact with the, with the drug you're taking. Um, certainly on the, on the iPhone, there are plenty of applications now in the App Store. Here's one that conveys emergency information to your providers and to anybody that you choose to share it with, with Polka. Uh, Vitality is a company that has glowing uh, pill cap, pill bottle caps that remind you when it's time to take your medication and wirelessly transmit and track when you've taken it, when you haven't. Freesia is a company that's uh, bringing a, a sort of tablet, as you see there, to take away check-in forms in the doctor's office, and, and they've had tremendous growth and, and are in more and more places increasingly. So yes, ultimately, Health 2.0 begins with the consumer. It's about the transparency and the choice that we, we, we have in the engagement. But what I've been excited to see, and I think what it will take uh, in the coming years, and, and the implications for people in this room, is really about the engagement of a whole set of stakeholders in health. And what started out as very hypothetical a few years ago is just, is just reality today. So, Pharma companies would come to our early conferences and say, well, we know something is going on that's of interest, but we just don't know how to get engaged. And now we've got products that really help. Our Xvantage is an example of a company that allows doctor's offices to schedule times for pharma reps uh, so that it's just not an intrusion in this sort of free-for-all. It really is a managed interaction. WebDig is a, a brand new technology out of Wool Labs, and it allows a pharma company with a particular drug to monitor what people are saying about that drug in various online forums, in Twitter, on their Facebook pages, in their blogs, because it's important. They may not be able to conduct a clinical trial once that product is out in the real world, but if somebody's reporting an adverse event in some online community, uh, these deep analytic capabilities of the web today with cloud computing can actually present a very precise, in real time analysis of your product is being discussed in five million places around the world right now, and here's a summary of it. I mean, it's a fascinating level of market research that was never possible before.
Health plans are beginning to offer enhanced services. Roy talked earlier about his product being available. I remember when Roy was starting his company a few years ago, and the pace of that development is phenomenal. Eliza, using uh, messages that come to you on your regular phone, uh, automated by, by an automated voice with reminders, with health, with health educational information being offered via health plans. Hospitals, uh, both from reaching out to consumers and patients, are also using very sophisticated web-based tools, using a lot of Health 2.0, Web 2.0 concepts to manage things like denied claims and to do triage. So things, again, that allow for increased transparency, user focus, uh, the ability to make decisions. Uh, these impact business-to-business -business operations in healthcare, as well as they impact how the consumer experiences healthcare. Government agencies, we're going to be having uh, the FDA speak at, at Health 2.0 in October, talking about how they've used Twitter and other various social media platforms extremely effectively to communicate to all of us about the peanut allergies and other sort of late-breaking news. Uh, the CDC uses a number of different social media mechanisms effectively as well. And physicians, outside of just sort of the institutional structures, are collaborating in ways that are just mind-boggling. The ability to share radiological cases, do teaching with each other, share patient cases, uh, and, and collaborate, do research. It, it's really uh, transformed, and is beginning to transform the ways doctors interact and collaborate. Uh, I get asked a lot about, well, what's, what are the revenue models for companies in Health 2.0? And the answer is people are still figuring it out as we go. So yes, uh, David Brailler, who had just come out of being the health IT czar, spoke at our first conference in 2007, and he delivered a, a pronouncement that's been, that's been true. He said, you know, many of the companies we're seeing here today won't be around in five years. And in two years later, some of, some of that is true, but we've also seen so many more companies where those have come from. Uh, 22 or so companies presented at our first conference, and just for October, we had 350 submissions and had to turn away 200. So we're just delighted. I mean, that's a good problem to have, and um, every six months we see that type, type of new company starting. So the revenue models uh, are still being defined, but certainly software as a service is, is an option. Software downloads, we're seeing incredible things happen with things like the App Store, transaction fees, data access fees, and working in, con in concert with pharma and other institutions that need access to consumers through consent, through opting in. Uh, can we use these platforms to, to deliver value to existing stakeholders in healthcare? And driven by member demand and audience demand, uh, the, con the conference is an event, but much like you know, David and I talk about, much like what goes on today here. But we realized there needed to be more, and there was a, a drive to say, well, we as young, innovative companies want to meet the Mayo Clinics of the world. We, we don't know how to get access to them. We're a bunch of smart developers in Silicon Valley that may have a good idea. So we started the Health 2.0 Accelerator, and we spun it off. It's a completely separate nonprofit organization run by Julie Merchinson of Manat. And it focuses on bringing together this sort of ecosystem of companies to work with each other to develop shared technology utilities, data sharing capabilities, as well as business development uh, partnerships. And we've been delighted to have Kaiser join, Catholic Healthcare West, to name a few, Project Health Design, and a whole slew of more of the young and innovative companies. And, and we're just seeing some really interesting collaborations. There'll be a showcase of what uh, has, has transpired as a result of these collaborations at the conference this year. So I've been delighted to uh, present and to meet all of you. I'd love to stay in touch. I know that we can't take any questions here, but uh, please feel free to reach out. And I look forward to, to talking more with all of you. Thank you.